Hi everyone, it's Rabbi Dr. Jack Cohen. Hope everyone's doing well. It was a beautiful Hanukkah season this year. Tonight, I thought we would take a trip down memory lane and analyze one of the great books in the history in terms of dating and marital harmony. It's a fantastic book. It's a book that I even used a great deal when I myself was about to get married and were preparing for marriage. It's called The River, the Kettle, and the Bird. And I'll get into an analysis of where that title comes from. Before I start, uh, anybody needs my help in dating or marital harmony would like for me to help you in terms of getting matched up or analyze a current re you know, a relationship that you're in or need help in any way in putting a top 10 list together, feel free to reach out to me. You can call me on my cell phone. I, I welcome it. It's 305. 206-1916 or WhatsApp me. It's most preferred. Send me a message on WhatsApp and we'll figure out a time that we can chat together. It's been a fantastic season. I think since October, Baruch Hashem, I've had my hand in about 10 engagements, three of mine directly, and seven I was I was fortunate to facilitate. Thank, thank you, Hashem. Um, but I'm really fat, I'm really excited about learning this book with you guys. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn some great wisdom by one of the great Rosh Hashivas in America. Rav Aaron Feldman is now Rosh Hashiva, of one of the oldest yeshiva in America, near, near Israel, near Israel in Baltimore. And he has some fantastic wisdom to share with us. So here we go. The name of tonight's lecture is taken from the passage in the Gemara in Mesechet Berachot, Mesechet Brachas, which tells us that a person who dreams of a river, a kettle, or a bird can look forward to having peace in their life. Who doesn't want peace? As a matter of fact, the last word in, when we seal the Talmud is Vesimu Chash Shalom, Hashem should give us peace. The greatest thing that we yearn for in our lives is that we should have a life of peace, whether it's peace in the home, peace with our family, peace with our workers, peace in general. Without peace, a person can't live and be productive. These are the three symbols of peace because they represent three possible levels of human relationships, that being the river, the kettle, and the bird, and I'll explain that. And essentially also, they are a description of the stages of development of a successful marriage. And therefore, they will serve as the framework for the idea of tonight's lecture. We'll start with the river, and we'll explain what that's all about, the, the kettle and then the bird. In its lowest form, shalom, or peace, means the absence of conflict. This state can exist when two people or groups maintain contact with each other to the extent that everyone is served in their own interests. And I'll explain what that means. The symbol for this type of peace is a river. A river is the classic vehicle of business or commerce between two cities. It represents a state of communication between two separate entities connected only by their mutual benefit. It simply means coexistence. The river, there's a river, there's town A and town B. The river serves the purposes of each one. Each one has its own self-interests. That's one type of relationship in which the man and woman live together, don't have much to do with each other, don't talk too much to each other. They're just like platonic relationship, but platonic friends. There's no emotional connection. That's not that, they're not that integrated. So that's one type of peace. We start there, the river. Now let's deal with the second level of peace, and that's the kettle. There's a second degree of peace. That exists where two people join together to reach a common goal, with neither alone, which neither alone could be able to fulfill it for themselves. For examples, let's say a band of people band together to build a building. So the plumber comes, and the architect, and the architect comes, the carpenter comes, and together they build the building because they have one common tachlis, one goal. Let's get this building built. It's a type of peach which is resulting in the achievement of an objective which could not have been realized alone. And that type of peace is symbolized by a kettle. What does that mean? A kettle is designed to prepare food by utilizing the combined talents of water and fire. Alone, water would destroy the food. Fire would burn it. But if you bring it together inside a kettle, now you can cook. Now you have two entities coming together to be able to participate in one common goal. The kettle has thus made possible a productive peace between fire and water. So that's peace level number two. Number three, the third and final level of peace is the peace of, a bir of the bird. A bird has two distinct talents. It can survive on earth and it can fly in the air. These talents are not separate skills. Why? Because the way the bird walks on the ground is affected by the way it's designed to fly. It walks with its legs designed in such a way that they can just prop up and they can fly. Conversely, the way the bird flies in the air is affected by the way it's intended to walk in the earth. Meaning that it's simultaneously both an earthbound and an airborne being. A bird therefore represents 
an embodiment of peace where two natures and two entities have merged into one unit. Understood on our level, a man with his own distinct makeup, a woman with her distinct makeup, come together and become what's called ishtoki gufo, one body. That's the highest level of peace. That's symbolized by a bird. Each of these three levels of peace can exist in a marriage. Each level reflecting the degree to which the peace between man and wife have worked on. The simplest level of marriage is the peace of the river. In such a marriage, each partner is prepared to fulfill their duties and obligations to the spouse faithfully, but they live their own separate and individual life. Rather sad, rather depressing, but there are marriages like that. They've learned to avoid disagreements and to live together peacefully, but although they don't fight, there's little emotional attachment between this man and that woman. There's simply two entities traveling in two different lanes and they stay out of each other's way. So that's the simplest level of peace. With that first level being zero emotional connection. The second level, which is the peace of the kettle, exists in a marriage where goals are set where each partner would be unable to achieve it separately. For example, we have a situation where the mother takes care of the home and the father goes out to work and they're both running their errands very faithfully and as a result they need each other but that the Mishnah tells us right is a love dependent on a cause we love each other because we're here for a common purpose we're gonna have kids and we're gonna raise those kids and we get the errands done like a corporation right when these goals no longer exist there's nothing left to bind them and the consequence is what the well-known emptiness divorce which we see a lot of of middle-aged couples where it doesn't go beyond the kettle level of peace. At a time of life when now they've raised the kids and the kids are out of the house and now they're in their 50s or 60s and physical attraction is weakened, when the children have grown and left the home, especially when the wife no longer needs her husband to support her, oftentimes we see after a career of being a homemaker the wife goes out there gets an education gets a job she's more independent there's no longer a reason for the couple to stay together because they never built their relationship on a level greater than a kettle their mutual goals have disappeared as the mission of sites tell, tells us when the cause is gone the love is gone as we say a love which is dependent on something, if the something is removed, the love is gone. In that case, this couple was not that emotionally connected. They had a common purpose, which was to build that home and get the kids taken care of, but they never really invested in each other, which will explain in the higher level of peace that's coming up, and that's the bird. The third and highest level of peace in marriage is peace, which is completely internalized. That is, it's a deep sense of identity which, where each marriage partner feels for the other person. The relationship has become so important and meaningful that neither of them considers himself or herself a separate entity. That we're one common entity. The best description that I could provide is an amazing story told about Rabbi Arya Levin, who was the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim maybe 100, 120 years ago. He's the father-in-law to one of the great rabbis who passed away about, say, 15, 18 years ago, Rabbi Yosef Shalom Eliashev. Rabbi Arya Levin's wife's foot was hurting, so he took her to the doctor. And when the doctor came into the examining room in Yerushalayim, and he says, what's the problem? So before Mrs. Levin could say a word, Rabbi Arya Levin speaks up and he says, our foot hurts us. Her foot, not his foot. But he saw her foot as his foot. That's the highest level of peace. That's the level of the bird. Each person in such a marriage is keenly sensitive to the other person's needs, as if it was their own. Your problem is my problem. Each person is as happy to give to the other as to receive from the other. There's no separate sensation of I. We're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, one concept, we. It's a we concept, it's a we mentality. That's a fantastic thing. It's a self -self selfless love between them and it transcends all emotion. This is the stage of marriage described by Malachi, who was a prophet, and he says, in the highest ideal of marriage, in the most purest form, here's what we shoot for. She will be your friend, and she'll be the wife of your covenant. Let's understand what that Pasuk means. For she is your friend, and she'll be the wife of your covenant. The wife of your covenant is a perfect description of level three, level, the peace level of the bird. Right? Because covenant in Hebrew means brit, which stems from the word bria creation. You two, husband and wife, are so connected 
that you're no longer separate entities, you're now one different word, you're a bri'ah, which comes from a bri'ah, you're a new creation, you one man and woman together. Marriage is, as a covenant is the ultimate perfection, that's the goal that we strive for. It's the piece of the bird, the sum of whole parts equals one. Now, how do you get there? How do you arrive, how do you build a marriage which gets to the level of the peace level of the bird? How does one move towards that? And the answer is that the peace of the bird depends on the peace of the cattle, and the peace of the cattle depends on the peace of the river. It's built, and I'll show you tonight, sequentially. This means that a couple can become totally connected to each other and achieve the peace of the bird only after they've lived and worked together successfully where they achieve the peace of the cattle. Right? But, all, but they can only live and work together successfully if they've learned to get along with each other on a very le elementary level. And that's the peace of the river. So we start by getting to know each other. Peace of the river, right? And then we start to blend and have common goals. Peace of the cattle. Ultimately, our, our destination, our tachlis, is to get to the point where we're one entity, like in the story of Avi 11, and it's the peace of the bird. Where are most marriages today? Unfortunately, Statistically, most marriages basically are at the peace of the river. They don't make it to the peace of the bird. The couple never learn to get along with each other respectfully and courteously, without annoyance or anger. If she get, asks you to get up and fetch the, uh, the magazine which was delivered, no, you go get it. Or she doesn't want to get out of the car because it's cold and you force her to get out of the car to do an errand, whatever, or it could be the other way as well. So tonight and in the next few weeks, we will confront the following questions. What are our obligations in marriage? How should man and wife treat each other? How can one learn to recognize the needs of the spouse? How can one learn to control anger? When these problems are mastered, man and wife can learn to work peacefully together towards their life's goals and create a loving relationship, which stems from the ultimate level of marriage, because she is your friend and the wife of your covenant. And if you're single, the best time to learn how to become a great dater is to listen to what we have to teach you tonight and in the next coming weeks. Because if you know the goal, you know the journey, you know how to get there, you know what highway you have to take. Okay, so let's ask the question. Why are marriages failing? What's going on today? Domestic problems and domestic discord or lack of shalom bias is the most widespread form of human suffering. It's rare to find a husband and a wife who don't fight intermittently if not frequently. So every argument, let's step back and say something, and make a disclaimer, every argument between man and wife is extremely damaging. It drains the flavor out of life and puts a halt to productive activity. Fighting begins a painful cycle of anger, insult, and vengeance. Let's talk a little bit about the statistics. Divorce rates give an indication of the wide scope of marital misery. Among non-Jews in the United States, the average divorce rate is about 65%. I looked it up today, by the way, the United States is third in the world in divorce rates. Although the figure is lower amongst us Torah observing Jews, we're not immune to this trend as we're seeing more and more of an uptick in divorce. According to reliable estimates, the divorce rates of Orthodox couples in America has tripled in the last 20 years. Most of them divorces in the early years of marriage. So tonight we're going to learn what can we do to prevent that. What can we do to avoid that? We don't want to become a statistic. Let's find out. This, however, doesn't tell the whole sad story. It's not just divorce. Many more children are affected by broken marriages in this population since in religious households, more children are born than in typical non-Jewish or Gentile households. Divorce does not end the suffering of marital strife. Marriage forms a natural human unit because it creates so close a union between the married partners, divorce leaves wounds which don't heal easily, as we all know from the horrible fights that take place in, with people who are divorced with their exes. The lives of the divorced partners often remain shattered for a long time. Vendettas, revenge, after they've separated. And the partners in a second marriage, which is built on the scar tissue of divorce, must work even harder to achieve success. If the divorce rate is 65% today for first-timers, I could tell you without hesitation, it's 75% easy. Second-timers and 85% third-timers. You've got to work that much harder to, prop, to induce peace as you're working off the scar tissue of the first marriage. The lives of children involved are even more seriously affected. Children perceive that they have been abandoned by the very people, their parents, whose role in their lives is to give them a sense of security. As a matter of fact, I have a I have a case right now where I'm helping someone who's um, going out 
He's the product of an Ivy League law school with a great undergraduate school to boot. And his problem is um, very, very poor self-esteem. You'd think a guy with that kind of background and that kind of profile would consider himself to be self-confident and would be able to be comfortable in social circles. And he's dating someone okay, but you think he'd have it under control. No. He's lacking tremendous amount of self-esteem, which is traced back to the instability having been raised in a one-parent uh, home. So we have a great question. From a Torah perspective, the divorce syndrome is very perplexing. First of all, we have to understand something. Marriage, the Torah teaches us, is good for a person. And it tells us in the Torah, Lotov hayot adam levado. It's not good for a person to be alone. I'm going to make a helpmate for the man. So how could something like marriage was designed by Hashem to improve our lives and bring benefit to our lives, something whose absence is described as not good, lotov, bring such misery to the world? If marriage is good, then how come there's so much misery in marriage? If Hashem created the concept of marriage to bring benefit to us and to you know, do good by us and improve our lot in life, why is there so much suffering and misery as a consequence of marriage? Would Hashem do something that would lead to negative? That would lead to evil? What's going on? Hashem created marriage in order for a person to have a partner, not to be lonely. So why is there so much of an outpouring of pain and misery stemming from marriage, divorce, and all the ugliness that comes from that? What happened to Hashem's plan for helping man overcoming the, the law tov? It's not good for you to be single. So why is there so much suffering as a consequence of marriages that fail? Shouldn't marriages be successful automatically because that's what God wants for man? The explanation and the answer for that is that marital unhappiness is caused by our own abuse of marriage. We don't understand the institution. We don't know how to behave in marriage. And as a result, we take something that Hashem designed which is for our benefit. We misuse it. We don't understand it. We exploit it for our own selfish reasons. And we destroy the beauty of it. When an instrument is used without regard to the manufacturer's manual, is it any wonder that it doesn't work efficiently? When we buy a car, we read the manual. When we buy a piece of equipment, when we buy a machine, we read the manual. If you don't understand or read the manual, then one is not surprised if the marriage fails. What then are the manufacturer's requirements for marriage? Now that you're telling me there's a manual, please tell me how to best succeed at it. So here we go. Marriage is the natural state that we're supposed to be. It says, Zachar v'nikivar baraam, Hashem created male and female. Based on this verse, or this pasuk, the rabbis note that an unmarried individual is not a human being in the full sense of the word. He's not shalem, he's chatzi adam. And that the ideal state for a man and woman in this world is to be married. Short of that, if you're not married, you're not considered the whole person. Marriage improves every dimension of life. In fact, when we consider how many human problems marriage solves, not only clearly do we see Hashem's hand behind it, but it appears to be nothing less than a miracle. A little background. Man exists on a physical level, emotional level, and a spiritual level. On each of these levels, marriage provides vital benefits. Let's go one by one. Again, marriage brings benefits physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let's understand how it does that. Okay, let's start with physically. The effect of marriage on a physical level is obvious. Without marriage, there would be new propagation of the race. The human beings would, would cease to exist. Marriage solves the problem of the survival of the human species. By itself, the bearing of a new generation does not ensure human survival, but marriage creates the entity that allows a child to be raised and reared and nurtured and fed and educated and so on and prepared for life. Without that concept of marriage, that couldn't happen. For virtually his first two decades, a person needs unlimited care and attention, an environment suffused with love and warmth, and constant educational guidance. And only marriage could provide that. So physically, marriage is responsible for the propagation of the human species and maintaining it. The emotional and social problems experienced by products of broken homes are evidence when there's a lack of marriage. Second, the second major physical problem, major physical problem which marriage solves is that of the sex drive. Without marriage, this potent drive would dominate most people's thoughts. Marriage liberates men from preoccupation with it and allows him to get on with the pursuit of his life's real goals. Because he knows he has a partner, someone that he's with, and he can just you know, take care of that need, that, 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 that sexual need, and that allows him not to stay focused on, on his goals or his work or his business or his education. But marriage is vital to men, not only in the physical plane, but the emotional plane. So we, again, 
We said two reasons, that, two benefits to mankind physically for marriage. A, it, it maintains the human species and the human race. And number two, it harnesses and it allows you to, you know, meet the needs of your sex drive. Number two, the emotional benefits to marriage. By nature, man is a social being. He can't live by himself. She cannot live by herself. How many people call me, Doc, I want to get married because I'm lonely, especially the older ones or the divorced ones or the widows and the widowers. Without the companionship of another person, the person suffers from loneliness and is unable to function to their full capacity. Marriage not only dispels and eliminates the loneliness, but provides companionship and creates the possibility of a close emotional relationship that can exist between two entities, two living beings, the love between a husband and a wife. Although human life would founder without the physical and emotional benefit by marriage, it's the next one that's critical. Its spiritual benefits are even the most important. So we said that marriage provides physical benefits, emotional benefits. Now let's discuss the spiritual benefits. Life as a Jew is inconceivable without marriage. First of all, our society as Jews is based on a value system which can only survive with marriage. Generally speaking, only from within the Jewish family unit can Torah values be properly transmitted. As the mother takes care of the children and she encourages them to go to yeshiva, she's responsible for their education, the mitzvahs that are involved, they're all evolve, evolve around the family unit. Just as vital as the spiritual benefits which marriage confers on the community are those which it confers upon each person. Man was created to serve Hashem and draw himself closer to Hashem. By striving towards these goals, you'll fulfill the purpose of creation. And that's why marriage is a spiritual path. Don't kid yourself. I tell, you, I tell everyone who comes to me or asks for my opinion, try to make sure that spiritually you are both somewhere near each other. To have too much of a discrepancy is no good. A serious obstacle, however, stands in the way of this success of spiritual growth. And that is something that Hashem planted in the world to test us and to give us some pushback to try to squeeze greatness out of us. And that's the evil inclination, well, as we say in Hebrew, the Yetzir Hara. Man's Yitzhahara drives him to concentrate, or drives her to concentrate, on their own physical desires, power and prestige, in order to become a servant of himself rather than God. And we see how ego can destroy people. If a person fails to stand up to these promptings of the Yitzhahara, he'll become increasingly removed from the real goals. This Yitzhahara is therefore a trap, keeping that person from happiness and success, which God intended to bestow upon us. Consequently, the greatest gift to a man is that which enables him to avoid that trap of loving himself or herself, falling to their ego. And that was, that's what marriage offers. Marriage keeps you humble because you're, you're going to be with a partner who knows the real you, even though you're trying to fake the real world. Marriage makes it possible for a person to, become, to overcome their inclination towards self-centeredness. That's the way we're created as human beings. We love each other. We're very self-centered. As a matter of fact, I was reading an article by Miles Friedman, a great dating and marriage therapist, and he says something in his practice. It's all about selfishness. That's what you see today. And that's the problem. That's the problem. We're not hitting the bar of the level of peace of the bird, where we become one and I care more about her. So marriage, in a good marriage, we work on curing this problem of selfishness and this self-centeredness. It permits a person... <clears throat> Marriage permits a person to change the focus of their existence from lust gratification and self-interest to the spiritual goal of selflessness. If you're working on yourself, Torah adjures us to work on ourselves. Musr teaches us that beyond us there are other people in this world besides us. Marriage not only controls the sex drive, it also converts us from a vehicle of acquiring to a vehicle of giving. In the right marriage, we learn to be givers. The sex drive becomes a means of expressing love to our wife or giving life to a child. Furthermore, marriage forces a person to cease their constant preoccupation with their own needs and to concern themselves with the needs of the spouse and the children. You're forced to think about other people, whereas if you're a single living alone, you never have to do that. And that's what marriage is great for. It can strip away that selfishness that we suffer from. As a person learns to become concerned with the other person's interests, your drives of greed and power are tempered. As a result, the personality is directed away from natural self-centeredness towards other-centeredness. And that's the goal. Marriage is the framework that allows us to become much more refined, much more caring and considerate human beings. This is the key to spiritual growth, thinking about the other person. As a matter of fact, a few weeks ago, a major publication asked me, what do I think is the greatest quality to look for? It was Parsha's Chayisara, and it's the Parsha which is known for Shaduchim, a publication that I write in, asked me, what do you think is the most important 
quality to look for in marriage that keeps the marriage humming. And I say, without hesitation, being mevater, letting the spouse go first, that you are taking second place to your spouse. Marriage is, of course, not an immediate ticket to spiritual perfection. Just because you're married doesn't mean you're automatically a tzaddik or tzaddiket. We see that still, even married people can be afflicted with selfish obsessions. However, it allows it, it at least puts it within reach. Because if you choose to marry properly, marriage can make a completely different GPS of your goals in life. On the other hand, without a wife or a husband and a family, person would have little hope of redeeming themselves from that spiritual wasteland because in a good marriage you're forced to work on yourself in a great I see with my life and I see in the thousands of people that I had the pleasure to mentor marriage is the vehicle to greatness how often do you meet people years later that have been married and you see how the Torah the values the mitzvot the mitzvahs and the marriage and the caring for other person changed them completely as it changes us in this light, we can understand why marriage is so important to Jewish people, perhaps even more important than any other people in the world. True Jewish life is filled with spiritual values, which cannot flourish without marriage. And how do we know this? We'll, we'll prove it to you. We know the concept of the sota, the woman that's accused by her husband for, be, for having an, an affair, or being, you know, being, you know, not being, uh, or being accused of infidelity. She has to drink a special potion known as the waters of the Sota in order to clear her name and permit her to live with her husband. And she's been accused of secluding herself with a strange man against her husband's wishes. In order not to die, she has to go through a certain ceremony where they take a piece of parchment that has a Shem's name in it, actually the parsha, the portion in the Torah that talks about that concept of the Sota. They take some water and some earth from the, near the altar in the Zbech to mix it. In the process, Hashem's name is erased and she has to drink from it. If nothing happens to her, then she's blessed and she's going to have children, she goes back to husband. But if God forbid she was, in, in, you know, in crim she had participated in this activity, she would blow up. The question is asked, why would Hashem allow his name to be erased for the possibility that she's a bad woman. We don't even know. And the answer is, Hashem is so interested and so vested in marriages succeeding that He's willing to even have His name erased for it. He doesn't care. He'd rather see, even if it's a mediocre marriage, He'd rather see two people come back together to each other, given that she was not guilty, and, and rebuild their home, and He's willing to allow His name, which is a capital crime. I mean, it's a crime to erase God's name. It's a horrible crime. But He says, Hashem says, I'd rather have my name erased, but if it, whatever it takes to reestablish re peace between a man and a woman. Now, great question. Which of life's three levels play the most significant role in creating a marital happiness? Is it the physical? Is it the emotional? Or is it the spiritual? Which one area is the most important area to be able to you know, be responsible for a, a successful marriage? Since happiness is an emotional state, we might assume, is it emotional? The truth is, all three are critically required. You need to have you need to feed the physical area, the emotional, and the spiritual, right? Because happiness in marriage depends on a basic element. Each partner is feeling that the other is devoted to that person. If I feel that my partner is devoted to me and will be with me thick and thin, that gives me the gumption, the gumption to go forward. Such a relationship cannot exist between two self-centered people. It's therefore impossible for them to experience full marital happiness because if they're not going to be concerned with each other, Right. Only by learning marriage's lesson of increased selflessness can a couple achieve happiness. The physical relationship, so the spiritual is critical because you're going to be focused on your, on your mate and you're going to work on selflessness. The physical side is also important. Besides enabling the creation of the family and the control of the sex drive, it also fosters an emotional bond between husband and wife when they're together in intimacy. Marital relations awakens a very strong feeling of closeness between the husband and the wife. Right. Indeed, the rabbis have told us that the sex drive was created in, in man in order to provide marriage partners a means of becoming close to each other. However, when the physical side of marriage is not an expression of emotion, you're not getting together in the bedroom because you love each other, only, but it's only to, for lust than damage to the marriage results. Lust fulfillment is nothing more than selfishness. Consequently, using sex for the sole purpose of physical gratification will undermine the very basis of marital happiness. This sort of love is destined to turn to hatred. If you want any kind of proof to that, let's take you back to the children of David Amelech. 
He had children from many wives. He had 18 wives. He had a son named Amnon, and he had a, from a certain wife, Ma'cha, and he had a, and he had a daughter named Tamar from the Eshet Chayot, from uh, rather Ishaf Torah, who was a woman that David had captured in battle, and he converted her and made a Jewish. This Amnon had a passionate lust for Tamar, and he contrived a way to be able to feign that he was sick, so she would bring him food, and he raped her. After he raped her, it says, He hated her, and he didn't even want to look at her. This is what happens when it's physicality without any emotion whatsoever. When a person turns to become an animal, it's like bestiality. And he would get his just desserts because Tamar's brother, would, Avshalom, would end up murdering his stepbrother and seeking revenge for what he did to, by violating his sister. So, clearly, the manufacturer's instructions for marriage require that a person commit themselves to developing other-centeredness. That the highest level that I'm shooting for as a man or woman in marriage is I'm focused constantly about what does my wife want? What does my husband want? Can I take care of them? Can I buy them something that they like? We're thinking about them all the time. So how do we, let's go back now, and let's say we're dating. How do you choose a mate, knowing that we know this information? Man was created to serve Hashem by studying his Torah, engaging in mitzvot, and making the world a place in which all of mankind can come closer to Hashem. Therefore, the most important question in selecting a spouse or a mate should be, does this man or woman have the same spiritual goals as I do? This is the question that I ask all of my clients when they, ask me, when they tell me about relationships that they're in the middle of. I ask them, it comes from the word hashkafa. Hashkafa means direction. It comes to the word mishkafayim. Are we looking out in the same direction? Do we have same values? Do we have same aspirations and goals in life? And will we be able to work together towards reaching these goals together? Which is determined when you date. And you do that by asking many great questions. And anybody who would like help with that, I've created a PDF that I've shared with thousands of people. A hundred questions you can ask in your dating relationships that will help you clearly understand if the person that you're going to dinner with and enjoying and have a fun, having fun with is the person that's going to be Mr. Right or Mrs. Right for you. If you need it, just send me a WhatsApp at 305-206-1916 and I'll send it out to you. Someone who doesn't meet these qualifications where they have the same spiritual goals and they can work together with you cannot possibly be considered a potential partner in life. Jewish marriage is also aimed at building a Jewish family and ensuring the transmission of Jewish values to the next generation. Serious thought needs to be given to determining what sort of mother, if it's a girl, would this woman make? Does she have the necessary qualities? What messages will be she communicating to children? What character traits will she be displaying and encouraging her children to imitate? And the same goes for the guy. Does is he committed to growth? Does he daven? Does he go to minion? Does he learn? Does he have a temper? Is he into himself or is he a sharing person? Is he generous or is he, or is he miserly? Many questions you have to ask. You know, is he focused on growth? Where is he going? Does he have a steady livelihood? Spiritual goals must be primary, but one cannot choose a spouse solely on spiritual grounds. Man is a mundane creature with mundane needs. Indeed, as we have said, marriage was created to satisfy many needs. Without emotional and physical satisfaction, man, man or woman cannot function properly. The emotional side of marriage helps us dispel loneliness, but it can often be more lonely living with an obnoxious person. Thus, it's imperative to carefully, eval carefully evaluate the person that I'm dating. Is that person pleasant to be with? Now we're evaluating the emotional component. The person I'm dating, are they pleasant to be with? Do I look forward to being with him or her? Is he or she considerate? Is he or she self-centered or selfless? Does he or she have a temper? Critical. Chazal tell us that a person who has a temper, it's like living in Gehenna, living in hell with them. Does he or she enjoy taunting people rather than helping them? Is he or she speak Lashon Hara? Are they focused mostly on, on gossip? The answers to these questions are critical to determining if the person that you're dating is Mr. or Ms. Right for you. So, how important is physical attractiveness? Many times, it's a big issue, today, especially today, in our very visual world. In light of the above, it would not be surprising that this is one of the less, least important considerations from the perspective of the Torah. For a marriage to be successful, a wife does not have to be stunning. Right? If a woman possesses the proper spiritual orientation and character qualities, a marriage has the capacity for producing true happiness, and a successful intimate relationship will develop as well. Given that the woman and the man possess proper spiritual orientation and have good character,
Physical attraction, unconnected with an emotional relationship, dissipates in a matter of weeks, if not a month, or even days. Of primary importance in a marriage is the capacity to create an emotional bond. Can I build a Kesha to that person? Can I create what's called emotional intimacy? Spiritual goals and personality, not physical attractiveness, are the critical factors. So, with that information, let's ask some questions. What are people doing today? How are people going about the task of getting married? What are they looking for? What, what, you know, how do they go about selecting a wife? Here's what's good. Let's, let's look at it from the perspective of 2023 man. Quality number one. Here's what people are searching for. Physical attraction. No matter how fit she may be for building or an ideal Jewish home, no matter how sterling her character, no matter how perfect her qualifications as a mother and a wife, if one angle of her anatomy or profile is flawed, she stands a good chance of being rejected. How often have I sat with guys and showed them one profile after the next and rejection, not my look, not my look, not my look. I ask them, how do you know what your look is? But this is unfortunate. This is how Western values corrupt us. Quality number two that people are using as a barometer to choose a wife today. What kind of an impression will she make? No matter how good she may be for me, what will my friends think of her? After all, I'm playing to the crowd. As we know, we call that the Yenta syndrome. How does she measure up to my friends' wives? Will I be getting more or less than them? It's unfortunate. Quality number three, assets. What do I stand to gain from the marriage? What is there in terms of me, in terms of family and money? I just had a person who called me up. He says, I'm only interested in dating girls that have money. I said, you're going down the wrong path, dude. That's not how I do it. In short, marriage is incorrectly conceived as a vehicle for appetite fulfillment and ego enhancement. The tipping point of disaster that leads to divorce. In the words of the Mishnah, marriage is used by man as a means for satisfying three things that the Mishnah tells us will whisk you right out of this world and you'll live a very short life. Kin'ah, ta'ava, and kavod, moti adam in aulam. The Mishnah tells us very clearly that jealousy, lust, and honor will whisk you right out of this world. You won't live a long life. And Unfortunately, it's these three areas that people are investing their appetites in, in terms of marriage, which is terrible, right? The rabbis consider these the smoothest paths to disaster. Kinah, ta'av and kavod, motzinat adam in alam. Jealousy, lust, and glory take a man out of this world. But as just as we just saw, and as just demonstrated to you with very clear evidence, it, these are the three areas that people are using as their templates to get married. It's a tragedy. Now. Why are marriages going wrong? Where are people making mistakes? By now it should be clear why so many marriages are going wrong. It's not that Hashem's plan has gone off cycle, not that Hashem's plan has gone awry. The marriage He created has the potential to give us a fantastic life. The institution of marriage that Hashem designed for us can give us a life which is satisfying and wholesome and fun and good. It can provide our most profound and satisfying emotional relationships. It can help us arrive at the pinnacle of spiritual fulfillment. But Hashem's plan will not work unless one condition is met. Again, Hashem's plan will not work unless one condition is met. What is that? That we use marriage to check our selfishness, not enhance our selfishness. That's the key. If you're other focused, right, instead of focused on yourself, you're focused on your, on your, on your, on your mate, then you can, you can expect to live a, a, a great life, a life of happiness and satisfaction. If you decide to pervert marriage, the result will inevitably be misery, misery and disinterest in life, which comes with horrible you know, misery and, unfortunately, divorce. Marriage counselors attempt to cure troubled marriages by advising the couple about enhancing their own physical pleasure and ego satisfaction, the direct opposite of what we're teaching you tonight, that this is the path of disaster. Nothing could be worse for a marriage. Such an approach leads the couple to strengthen their Yetzirah and only magnifies their selfishness instead of teaching them how to overcome it. They're not getting the message that if you want to be truly happy, it's about being a giver. It's about caring about the other person. The more you do that, the more the marriage is going to be wonderful and the happiness and joy will radiate. This, uh, this amounts to treating an illness by adding to its causes. And this is what these uh, non-Torah-based minds or psychologists or Gentile uh, experts are telling people to do. Such attempts are doomed to failure. They can't cure the ills of marriage. 
all they'll do is magnify it, make it worse. The only way to avoid or resolve marital discord or lack of shalom bias is by building the marriage in accordance with the original Torah plan, by using marriage as a vehicle for becoming concerned with another human being's welfare. The only counseling which can be effective in solving a shalom bias crisis is that which teaches marriage partners to become solidly concerned with each, other, each other's pleasure and ego, not myself, even at the expense of their own. Marriage will then become what God intended it to be, an instrument for joy and happiness. Now, where are people going wrong? Some of the major problems of marriage are rooted in the un unrealistic expectations where when it comes to marriage. Therefore, before sitting out to describe what a marriage should be, we must first spell out what a marriage should not be. Marriage is not the fantasy which newly married couples think it may be. While fantasies are not real, they're not necessarily harmless. They could be very harmful. If the fantasies are not put to rest quickly, disillusionment can be disastrous, which is what's waiting for you around the corner. The major fantasy about marriage is that it confers eternal bliss. We know that's purely a fable. Two rules stem from this, that married people are constantly in love, that's a, a fable, it's a fantasy, and that spouses have no faults. Fantasies are largely forms of wish fulfillment. Thus, whatever our innermost desires, which may be lost, power, prestige, right? We fantasize that marriage will achieve it for us. That's absolutely wrong. Marriage is not going to change or solve anything. It is a great framework for growth. Marriage will not solve your problems. I often tell people, if you haven't cured your own personal problems or emotional problems, get to work on it when you're single. Because if you think you're going to go into marriage and cure it there, you're only going to make it worse. The fantasy of marriage as internal bliss thrives especially amongst those who've grown up under the influence of Western values. Walt Disney didn't do us a, did us a big disservice. From their early years, children are informed that the close company of a man or woman produces quick and permanent ecstasy. Couldn't be further from the truth. The victim of too many of these messages expects to find internal bliss in marriage. Just get married and I'll live forever happily. That's not the way it works. Another cause of fantasies about marriage is the sex drive itself, viewed by many single young men as their most troublesome problem. Because it overshadows or else, they're led to believe that they'll find relief from this problem, the problem, problematic sex drive through marriage. And they think that, that their lives will be problem free. This is of course very naive. Coping with the sex drive is only one of life's many challenges, as the difficulties of married people so plainly testify. If you look at the statistics, in terms of why people divorce, never, hardly ever, is problems in the bedroom listed as one of them. So it's not the issue. And it's not going to bring, uh, you know, eternal bliss if you have that. There are many things you have to address and invest time in to fix and cure while, and, and work on when you're married. Unfortunately, misinterpretations from the Talmud do their part as well in bolstering marriage fantasies. I'll give an example. The rabbis tell us in the Gemara that whoever lives without a wife lives without joy. Whoever lives without a wife lives without bracha or blessing and whoever lives without a wife lives without Torah. This seems to imply that with a wife you'll automatically just inherit these things as it just happens automatically. Couldn't be further from the truth. The rabbis also say that 40 days before the conception of the fetus, a heavenly voice calls out a bot call, so-and-so will marry so-and-so. So it seems like a wife is preordained by divine decree and she'll be there to meet man's need in every way. A righteous woman, we're told, will do the will of her husband. Thus, these fantasies emerge that a wife will automatically cater to every woman desire of her husband and that she'll be able to intuit his every wish even before he even says it. She'll know automatically what he's thinking and provide it for him. When not serving him, she'll find no greater joy than gazing at him with adulation. To the many young men beguiled by these fantasies, it's practically axiomatic that life's goals will be realized early in life. Right, now, the speeches at the wedding and the week-long Sheva Bracha celebrations continue to add to the problems, right? He's built up as the next Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, she's built up as the next Mrs. Moshe Feinstein, and uh, he's unequaled in his character, she's unequaled in her character, and they've built up this amazing expectations of the man and the woman. Now it's time to move in and live together. So now that they move in and live together, and now the problems begin. Unfortunately, the fantasies are very short-lived. 
Slowly, the shocking truth sets in. The physical attraction begins to lose its initial excitement. The wife who no longer preens herself and takes care of her eyelids, dusts her makeup every few hours like she was when she was dating, right? And doesn't wear a different dress for every date like she did when she went out with him, appears somehow less attractive. Her attitude towards him has changed for the worse. Probably as a result of being able to see him daily from close up, her admiration of her husband now dims and gets less and less. She no longer accepts his opinions uncritically and often even claims to know better than he does. And she'll shut him up once in a while. She's not at all the perfect human being he thought he was marrying. There are obvious flaws. She's not as calm as relaxed as she was on the dates. She can be shrill and panicky. She can be stubborn and illogical. Especially disturbing is the absence of that surge of accomplishment and wisdom which he expected to materialize once the fetters of bachelorhood were cast off. These are the fantasies that are built up in the young man and the young woman's heads. Worst of all, he feels lonely sometimes. He cannot share so much of his life with her. She doesn't appreciate his words of Torah. She doesn't laugh at his jokes anymore. She doesn't accept his opinions so easily. She doesn't grasp his jokes. She doesn't like the same music he likes. She has different tastes in clothing and in home furnishings. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? He often wishes he was single again and in the company of his old friends. He had it much better, he thinks, when he had his guy friends and he used to go out for dinner. There were no bills to be paid, far fewer distractions, no wife who would need constant attention, no decisions weighing on his mind. As these fantasies dissipate, terrifying questions begin to insinuate themselves in his mind. Is she the right one? Did I make a mistake? Did I marry the wrong girl? The questions gnaw at him. Because he's too ashamed to share them with anyone, they fester inside of him. Disappointment and hurt begin to seep through his emotional fabric. He suspects that his marriage is a mistake. He feels trapped and wonders, will this marriage even make it? I've had people sit in front of me, most recently a couple that's only married six months and having serious problems. He begins to feel resentment towards the wife having concealed her true nature from him before they got married. The resentment breeds an anger which grows within him. One day he can't tolerate it and his disillusionment and bitterness gets the best of him and he pours it out in an act of rage on her. The wife is shocked and hurt. The man she loves and who she thought loved her has now turned against her. Before long her shock gives rise to bitterness and anger and she retaliates and now it's a give and take. A cycle of attack and counterattack is set into motion with tragic consequences. Now, what's going on here? Let's take a step back. The only problem which marriage solves is the problem of bachelorhood or bachelorhood. That's all it solves, right? Marriage itself provides no ultimate answers. It's simply the best framework for dealing with the problems of living. If life presents difficulties, this should not be surprising. Life is meant to be a series of challenges. Marriage is not the all cure all to everything in your life that's not going your way in bachelorhood. There's no lasting bliss on this earth. What matters is that we meet challenges of life properly, for then we'll have accomplished our purposes in creation. That means we can't get out of nisyonot and nisyonis. There's going to be challenges in life. But the rabbis tell us the best way to deal with it and work through it is through the framework of marriage. As the rabbis tell us, today this world, Hayom la'asotam umachalik abel sikharam. Today this world is for work, we're in this world to work, to deal with issues, to find solutions to things, and tomorrow in the world to come is for the happiness of the reward. We want us to operate with the natural state of existence called marriage to meet the challenges of life. What the rabbis are telling us is that you're not going to escape challenges of life, but the best way to work through them and to grow from them and to respond to them is through the institution of marriage. Now, there was a famous rabbi, his name was Rabbi Chasman, Leib Chasman. He was the famous mashkiach, one of the great yeshivas of Israel, Hebron Yeshiva. He once saw a student eating fish with great relish. He was really enjoying the fish. Tell me, young man, the rabbi asked the student, do you love fish? And the student said in the affirmative, yeah, I love fish. So the rabbi asked him a question, if you love fish, then why don't you take care of the fish that you're eating? Instead of eating and devouring it, why don't you allow it to live and feed it and sustain it? But instead, you're devouring it. And the student, as the student groped for a response, Rabbi Leib explained to him, I'll answer you. It's not that you love fish. You don't love fish. You love yourself. That's what you love. Rabbi Leib was trying to drive home the point that what most people call love is not love. 
It's self-love. The love that America or the media tries to sell us on is not love, it's self-love. The love sold on the billboards and in television screens and monitors all over the world is merely the selfish love of pleasure fulfillment. The romance portrayed on, in his movies and books and novels is just a glorification of, of our baser instincts, a fantasy of physical and emotional gratification. The love that they're trying to sell us on in Hollywood is not loving someone else, it's what I can get out of it myself. It's self-love. Real love exists where one is willing to give up something dear to him for the benefit of another person. Real love is the giving love. The love that we see on the movie screens is the taking love. Developing a relationship of love is not an instant process. One cannot love unless something has triggered that love. When a person feels gratitude for things which another person has given them, when they find noble qualities in another person, when they sense that someone is devoted to them unconditionally, only then can you truly say that you love that person. So it's all about giving, appreciating the goodness in someone else. Not surprisingly, this form of love does not come during the early stages of marriage. It takes time to develop such a love. Two strangers who have met each other a limited number of times in dating before becoming husband and wife cannot possibly enjoy that degree of love, emotion, of mutual devotion. Love in its true sense is only possible between two people who have spent many years sharing experiences, working towards common goals, undergoing sacrifices for each other, building a life together. And that could take years. The love that we're thinking of is a love that takes work and time. This is why the early years of marriage are the most difficult and why most divorces occur during this period because people are not willing to think long term that I'm in it to learn how to be a giver. Instead, if you're thinking about taking, taking, taking and you don't cure that illness early on in the marriage, that's usually why we see most divorces take place early on. Because that, that man, that woman wasn't trained to focus on the long term picture, which is to be the giver. All right. <clears throat> A newly married couple needs more work during the first year of marriage than in any other state of their married life in learning to be compatible. As a result, the Torah gives a man exemption from going to the army. He doesn't have to go to the army. And oftentimes in yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva allows the new couple to be together at night the first year because they need to get to know each other. That's critical. The more I get to know you, the more I appreciate you, the more I, I, I get to be a giver to you. Marriage cannot begin with true love. There's no such thing. What should be present is a strong commitment by both partners to devote themselves to helping each other and serving each other as a lifelong friends to each other. This means that a husband must undertake to treat his wife as well as he would treat himself, and vice versa. To fulfill her physical and emotional needs, to ensure her happiness, to deny her nothing he would not deny himself, and to treat her with due respect and vice versa. All of this is contained in how the sages prescribe for us the duties of a husband to his wife. He must love her as he loves himself and honor her more than he honors himself. This means that he has to satisfy her needs as much as he satisfies his own needs and he must concern himself with making her feel as respectable in his eyes as in the public's eyes, even more than he concerns himself. As Ravik de Miller, my Rebbe, would tell us, one of the Ten Commandments of marriage is to be loyal to each other, to stand up for each other's reputations. If someone says something about your wife or husband, you leap to your feet and you defend each other, even if the, what the person said is true, but you have to deny it in public so that you can always defend the reputation of your spouse. And that's why the Prophet Malachi calls a wife, she's your friend, and then she becomes the wife of your covenant, which makes perfect sense. Because uh, ideally, you start a marriage as two friends, and you get to know each other well. Once you've really, you, and you graduate from level to level, to the point where we said you become the, she becomes the wife of your covenant. What is that? Marriage as a covenant is a marriage imbued with the love create, created where they have absolute unity. The order in this verse, first a friend, and then the wife of your covenant, is put there for a reason and refers to the way our marriages develop. If the first stage is that she's your friend where you care about her and you get to know each other and you share and you're givers, automatically you'll graduate to where she becomes the wife of your covenant, where you become one unit, one entity. And that's important. So thank you so much for joining me this week. 
Join us next week on Tuesday at 9 o'clock on, in, on Instagram Live. We're going to go with part two. There are going to be four or five parts to this book, but it's extremely educational, and we can learn so much from it in order to grow our marriages. And again, if anyone has any questions and needs my help in any way in terms of consulting and dating and marriage, you can reach out to me at 305 206 1916. You need to get matched up, whatever it may be. I'm happy to help. Have a wonderful week and Shabbat Shalom.